In this video, we're going to be looking at the origins of mountains. So an orogeny is a mountain building event. Normally, this is going to be tectonically related. Um, most mountains are going to be created at convergent plate boundaries, but not all of them. We're going to be looking at some examples that are and some examples that aren't. In this case, this is a lovely shot of the Colorado Rockies, one of our largest mountain belts here in the United States which we aren't actually going to be covering in this. Um, they've got a really strange um, and really complex history that doesn't quite fit the models that we're going to be using for class. Um, but it is a really interesting set of mountains. Now we can define mountains um, as areas with elevations that are significantly higher than the surrounding areas and I'm sure there's there's a specific difference between a mountain and a hill at some point but these are just really tall places the elevation of the surface of the earth depends on the thickness and the density of the crust um, and we'll look a little bit about kind of crust movement and crust thickness at the very end here here you can see um young and old mountain belts throughout the earth the young ones are in yellow it includes the north american cordillera and the andes mountains down the western coast of north and south america plus pretty much all of central america you have a band that goes through the mediterranean across the himalayas and out into the uh, uh very east asia areas and down into indonesia and some of these locations too so all very very young things the purple belts are going to be a little bit older mountains, and the Urals are fairly old. That's when um, Eurasia all met up together. But we also have the Caledonia and the Appalachian Mountains. These are concurrent ages here, so those were formed at the same time when Pangaea was formed. Um, in this, you can also see the shield locations. So a shield is a really old, really stable piece of crust. So if you want to find the oldest rocks on Earth, these are the places to go. Now our first location, our first way to make a mountain is going to be at a subduction zone. If subduction occurs at convergent plate boundaries where oceanic crust is forced down into the mantle. Now the interaction between these two plates creates compression um, and so we get some deformational structures. We also get melting of the mantle that forms volcanoes. Um, here's a lovely shot of the Andes, nice rugged high peaks. So let's look at this. So um, these are parts of a subduction zone and we've talked about this before. You've got the trench that marks right where that uh, those two plates meet. You also have a volcanic arc. This works for either ocean ocean like you see here or ocean continent. Um, and then between the arc and the trench, you have the four arc area. And those are the places we're going to be sort of focusing on for this. So the Andes is kind of the perfect example of how of the subduction zone mountains. All right, so how this starts is going to be at a passive plate margin. So you can see nice wide continental shelf, lots of material built up there, oceanic crust out here, nothing happening. And then everything changes and you start getting compression from that oceanic crust um, being shoved towards the continent and then shoved under there. So you can see what's happened now is all of that material that was on the uh, continental shelf has been folded up into form. So you get folds and thrust, uh, folds and thrust vaults through here making these fold and thrust belts this um they also happen on land if you had significant sediment built up on land it can do that too not just out in the ocean um, this folding and thrusting creates horizontal shortening and you get significant surface uplift now when you've got this um, oceanic material being folded, we call this an accretionary wedge. Um, and every once in a while that accretionary wedge gets tall enough that it's actually exposed up at the surface. And, and so here's a beautiful example of what you see in especially older um, locations. You've got this tall exposed accretionary wedge. Your four arc basin is now dry. Um, but it's going to be lower in elevation. And then you have your mountain system, another mountain system out here. Um, these were our ancient volcanoes. 
you also have Pluton. So as the, sub the subduction is going to cause melting of the mantle and the rising magma may actually reach the surface that creates volcanoes and lava flows, among other materials, um, that create volcanic mountains. But the magma might also stall out and not actually rise to the surface. And in that case, it cools underground and you form plutons. And this plutons, this plutonic material being injected into the crust um, adds thickness too. So you have injection of this material into the crust and you have volcanoes on top, which both thicken the, the uh, continental crust too. So a beautiful example of this is the Cascade Range. So if we look out here, You've got the Olympic Mountains along the coast of the Pacific Northwest. If you drop down into that Fork Basin, you've got areas like Portland and Salem all the way down to Eugene, Oregon. Um, so you can see it's it's that drop down lower elevation kind of flatter area of the Fork Basin. And then over here are the Cascade Range volcanoes. So much, much higher. It's a beautiful example there. Um, there's a shot of the Olympics that's an accretionary wedge that's gotten high, folded and pushed up high enough, um, exposed behind Seattle. So these are a case where it's actually very high. These are interesting because they're so high, they actually change the weather patterns, um, and you actually get temperate rainforest. So you get hundreds of inches of rain in some of these locations along the Olympics. Another beautiful example of the a subduction zone at least an ancient one is the sierra nevada that run down through southern central and southern california um, so this is yosemite valley you see over here is half dome but these are all beautiful granites that were in place as plutons so if we look the western coast of north america um, the northern part is currently a subduction zone but the southern part you've got the san andreas fault system but if you go back 30 million years ago we actually had a subduction zone off the coast of Southern California too. So you had the Farallon plate being shoved under the North American crust, um, created these folded rocks of that, um, it's called the Franciscan complex, but this is the accretionary, accretionary wedge. And you had active volcanoes of the Sierra and Arc, and that Sierra and Arc, obviously all the volcanic material is gone, but we still have that plutonic material um, in the Sierra Nevada as we know it now. So if we look here, this is California right now. Here along the coastal range, these are all that folded up um, accretionary wedge material. You drop down into the Great Valley here. This is the Four Arc Basin. And then way back here, this is the Sierra Nevadas. And this is that ancient volcanic material that is all those plutons that were underneath the volcanoes. So if we look at one more, the continental collisions. Now these fold, form fold and thrust belts too. You get these beautiful thrust and reverse faults as well as um, lots of folds, lots of anticlines, lots of synclines. Now this forms because an oceanic plate is being is completely subducted under. When the two continents collide on either side of that ocean, this creates those thrust faults um, in which the edge of one block slips up and over the margin of the other. And sometimes you have little slivers of the oceanic crust left behind. These are called ophiolites, O-P-H-I-O-L-I-T-E-S, and ophiolite. It's pieces of the oceanic crust that actually sits up on the continent now. Um, so let's look at some examples here. Um, you've got the collision of India with Eurasia. All right, so when we start, if we go back in time a few million years ago, you had India out in the middle of the ocean moving itself towards Asia, and in between those two continental material pieces of continental material, you had oceanic crust. So you have this subducting oceanic crust as that's being subducted under. It's pulling along India with it. This is actually very fast subduction because India is moving very, very quickly. Um, and so what's eventually going to happen is India runs into Tibet. And we say these are sutured together. Um, and this ended up creating lots of folds because of the compression. Um, you get lots of crustal thickening here, too, and, and a really high-grade metamorphism run along this mountain belt to form the Himalayas. 
Um, so you can see lots of folding, lots of faulting. There's chunks of ophiolite stuffed in there right along that suture too. And if you look buried way out here is that former volcanic arc. So this is sort of like the uh, Sierra Nevada is now. It's just buried again. There's a lovely shot of the Himalayas for you to see what that looks like currently. Let's look at one more of these, the Appalachians in eastern U.S. Um, so if we rewind 600 million years ago, you had North America and Africa, somewhere about where they are right now. But in between was a little microcontinent and a little volcanic island arc. Now what's going to happen is you see subduction zone 1, subduction 2. This first subduction zone is going to completely close up and it's going to pull North America and ram it into that microcontinent. This is what creates the Blue Ridge Mountains that we know today. Now, of course, things are still moving together. So what we're going to do is now we're going to completely subduct this piece of oceanic plate. And we're going to slap that island arc on the edge. And that's what creates the Carolina Slate Belt. Now, these are still moving towards each other. So notice subduction zone changes so now this atlantic material is being subducted under north america and so this was full-blown big earthquakes big volcanoes big tsunamis off of the eastern coast of the united states at 400 million years ago but just like the rest of them we're going to completely subduct this under we're going to run those continents together and now you have the appalachians fully formed and you also have Pangea. So same deal. We've got chunks of Ophiolite. We've got that eight, some of those ancient plutons left behind. But of course, it didn't stop there. And Pangea split back apart. So Africa takes back off. And you had the developing uh, North Atlantic. Now, what you hopefully noticed here is over time, that North American plate got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, this is what we call accretion. So accretion is when you slap, basically slap pieces of um, island arcs and pieces of microcontinents onto a continent. This is how continents actually grow bigger um, through this process of accretion. There's a great example there for you. If we look at the western part of the United States, a lot of this is because the western part is grown because of accreted terrain. So you can see ancient island arcs that have been slapped on the side, ancient submarine material, ancient ocean floor material, even little pieces of continents. You can't see it very well. Um, but here in Arizona, places like um, Jerome, where we have lots of copper deposits, among other metals, um, and gold. Um, that was actually ancient volcanic island arcs that actually um, created those metals and they were slapped on. All right, one last way to make a mountain. We have continental rifting. So this varies from the rest of them because in this case, this is actually at a divergent plate boundary and it creates tensional stress. Um, but that tension... Um, creates normal faults and that movement along normal faults creates down dropped crust we all know as grobbins um, and the small sets of elongate mountain ranges that separate the down drop blocks are often known as fault block mountains or we refer to them as horst um, when we talked about structures before all right so beautiful example is the western part of the united states so here's the before shot what it used to look like and here it is now after it all stretched out um, and those fault block mountains cover southern part of arizona parts of southern california and pretty much all of nevada and a little bit of that western part of utah so each one of those is a fault block mountain so if we look at this, we're going to go back to that beautiful subducting plate that we were looking at earlier off the coast of California that formed the Sierra Nevada. Um, as it was subducting, you had the Sierra Nevada arc, volcanic arc forming, um, and it's also pushing up the Rocky Mountains thanks to that compressional stress. But at some point, that plate boundary changed, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. But what that does is it actually sets up a period of tension. Um, so as that 
subducting plate pulls down and actually starts stretching everything out there behind the Sierra Nevada. And it causes extension and uplift and, of course, those lovely normal faults to make the Basin and Range Province we know today. And that's why you have Basin and Range Province in the uh, right back behind that Sierra Nevada arc. Now let's look at this a little bit differently. Um, here's a little quick video to show you how this happens. Um, so what you can see is this is right around 40 million years ago. You got the North American plate over here. You can see all the states kind of skewed together. You got the Pacific plate out here, and then there's this little Farallon plate. And the Farallon plate's being subducted under uh, the North American plate, but there's a spreading ridge. There's a divergent plate boundary that separates the Farallon and Pacific plate. What you're going to notice is that subduction actually occurs faster than that uh, divergent happens. So that spreading center actually gets subducted under. And so you can see when it slides under the North American plate, everything starts getting spread out quite nicely. And there's the formation of the San Andreas Fault System. All right, so there's your three ways to make a mountain. There's one other term that we use in geology that I should point out now. Um, it's called isostasy. So isostasy is really all about the equilibrium um, it's the balance of these uh, crustal material, of the crustal material on the mantle. So here's some wooden blocks, and they're all sort of floating, but there's pieces sticking up and pieces sticking down below, which is exactly how our mountains work. So as you get crustal thickness, uh, the crust gets thicker and thicker as we add mountains, they also tend to sink down into the mantle. Now these wooden blocks, I want you to imagine hopping up on top of that middle one. Once you stand on it, it's just gonna push that middle block down a little bit. And if I take you back off, if you hop back off, it's going to pop back up. And the same thing happens to our crustal material as it kind of floats um, on the mantle. It moves up and down some. And that's when you load it with extra material to make mountains or as mountains are eroded. Um, so one of the ways to add material is through ice. Uh, so 15,000 years ago, we had the last glacial maximum, which means there were glaciers that actually covered um, all of Greenland, all of Iceland, and most of, pretty much all of Canada, and quite a bit of the very northern, northern part of the United States. That's heavy. And as it sat on top of the crust, actually pushed it down. Um, because it's so heavy. But then all of that ice melted. And as it's melted, what's happening is the crust is actually popping back up over time. And that's what you see here. This is a map of what's called isostatic rebound. That's where it's popping back up thanks to isostasy. Um, this is over the last 6,000 years. Um, so these are in meters. I want you to notice there's places here that have actually risen by over 100 meters over the last 6,000 years, which is really, really high. So this is kind of where the, the heaviest part of those glaciers were. If you notice, some of this actually splits the um, Great Lakes. These are actually, there's places on the northern part of the Great Lakes that are rising so hot, so fast um, that there's actually old docks that are, are really, really old. You're looking, you know, a hundred, couple hundred years old that they're actually dry now because they've lifted up out of the water at this point. Um, so this isostatic, this isostasy is kind of an important point when we start looking at um, mountains and changing the thickness of the crust too. So there you go. There are your three ways to make a mountain. You can get subduction zones, which cause volcanoes. You can get um, continental collisions, which makes fold and thrust belts, which folds mountains and pushes them up. Or you can have a divergent plate boundary, which create horst and grobbins, and those um, horst uplifted areas create mountains as well.